This could be considered the goat sandwich. The bun mi, in my opinion, is a perfect sandwich with the right amount of salt, spice, sweet, sour, crunchy, and soft. Just all the right flavors and textures, and I've enjoyed it every single time that I've eaten one. I'm by no means an expert on Vietnamese cuisine. In fact, I've never made any Vietnamese dish before, but my friend Jordan suggested that I try to make a bun mi, so I couldn't get it out of my head and I had to try it. This shouldn't be taken as authentic, this is just something that I kind of threw together based on some recipes and techniques that I saw online, and I'm just going to share what I did. My process takes at least two days, mainly because of the pickled vegetables which is what we're going to start with. I started with about a half pound each of carrot and daikon radish. You should be able to find daikon at your local Asian market. I'm just washing and peeling each so that I can julienne them or cut them into thickish matchsticks. I'm using my mandolin set to julienne because it's much easier and I'm not very good with a knife so I can't cut that thin without taking a really long time. I just chop until I have enough to fit into my 8 ounce mason jars. I'm also going to hit them with a quick pinch of salt and let them rest for a few minutes. This is going to internally season them and draw out some excess moisture as well as tenderize them a bit. To make life easier, I'm going to use my mason jars to measure my pickling liquid. The measurements here don't have to be perfect. I just did about two parts water to one part white vinegar and left a little bit of room at the top for the displacement of the vegetables. I also added a pinch of salt and a spoon of sugar, but in hindsight, I would just add that to the pot afterwards because it kind of sticks to the jar if you put it in now. But regardless, I dumped them into a pot and start to bring them to a boil. Meanwhile, we're going to add in some dry aromatics just to boost the flavor a bit. In my case, I just added two star anise, a handful of coriander seeds, and just a bit of mustard seed. Once that's boiling, we're going to bring it to our jars and dump about half into each one, trying our best to divide the dry spices evenly. Then we just let those cool for a little while and then we can cover them and refrigerate them until we need them. I made mine three days in advance, but I think just one day in advance is sufficient. You can do it the same day, it's just not going to taste as good. The next thing I would suggest doing at least a day in advance, or at least several hours, is our pork belly. Now most recipes I saw used skin on pork belly so that they could crisp it up. I could not find a skin on pork belly, so I just bought this skinless one. This is just like a generic grocery store brand. But I had an idea I wanted to try since I couldn't find that many skinless recipes. Mine weighed about five and a half pounds, so I'm gonna cut it in half lengthwise, which to me means leaving the bacon strip side intact, if you know what I mean, just in case I wanna use it for something to keep that shape later. Since I don't have any skin, I wanna protect the surface of this pork belly from burning in the oven because I'm gonna be cooking it nice and slow so that that fat renders out nicely. So I'm going to kind of cook it like oven baked ribs inside of foil for a few hours. So first I lightly scored the fat side of the pork in this crosshatch pattern. This is going to give us more surface area which is going to allow the fat to render better. And then I took some liquid smoke and rubbed a small film around the whole pork belly as little as possible because this stuff is really strong. This is just to serve as a binder so if you don't want to use liquid smoke or you don't have it you can use oil or you can use something like mustard which a lot of people use. We just need something for the seasoning to stick to and I just wanted to give it a little bit of a smoky flavor. Which speaking of seasoning I'm going to start by liberally salting the entire surface of the pork belly fat included. I always keep my salt separate from any rubs that I use because I want to be as precise as I can with it. And you want to salt really well because it is pretty thick and you want the salt to account for the inside of the pork belly as well as the outside. And I kept my rub pretty simple, trying to keep it somewhat resemblant to a Vietnamese bun mi. I started with Chinese five spice. I did about two parts of this to one part of light brown sugar. And then I just cranked in a bunch of pepper and mixed that all together. Again, I'm going to cover every surface of the pork belly well, including the edges. So I'm going to kind of mop up whatever fell down onto the cutting board. And then for some precision and to make my life easier, I'm going to use one of these probe thermometers to keep temperature while it cooks. This is because we're going to be covering in foil and I don't want to have to disturb the pork just to check on it while it's cooking. But if you don't have one of these for reference, my two and a quarter pound pork belly took about two and a half to three hours in the oven at 225F or 105C. But we're going to cover it as tightly as possible with foil, use heavy duty if you have it, and place on a wire rack to let the air circulate around it. And then again, just put it into an oven at 225F or 105C until it reaches temperature, which again was about two hours and 45 minutes for me. Also important, if you remember to do it, is to place the fat side up, which is going to allow the fat to melt and kind of baste itself as it runs down the pork belly while it cooks. Once it reached 145 degrees, I pulled it out and let it rest at room temp for a couple hours. It carryover cooked up to 150F, which to me is perfect, because we're going to be crisping this in a pan, which is going to cook it a little further before we eat it. But yeah, once it's close to room temp, we can place it covered into the fridge overnight, or for at least a few hours to let it cool down completely. This is going to allow for the juices to settle and for the fat to seize up, which is going to be better while we're eating it. The final component we're going to make in advance is the French style bread that's going to make our sandwich. I'm going to straight up say that I'm not a talented bread maker. 
I don't have a lot of experience with it. I enjoy doing it, but I'm just barely learning right now. So if you want a real baguette or French bread recipe, I would look somewhere else and just make the other components for the sandwich. But I'm gonna show you what I did anyway, and maybe you can learn something from me. I started with 360 mils or one and a half cups of warm water that I dumped seven grams or one packet of active dry yeast into, as well as four grams or one teaspoon of sugar. I roughly mixed that up and let the yeast proof for a few minutes while I prepped the rest. Into the bowl of a stand mixer, I added 500 grams or four cups of bread flour, as well as 10 grams or one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. Once the yeast is proofed, I add that mixture to the bowl and begin to mix with the dough hook on low speed. Once that begins to form a rough dough, I'm going to add in two ingredients that are supposed to enhance my dough, and those are 15 grams or two tablespoons of vital wheat gluten and 10 grams of diastatic malt powder. I don't fully understand the science behind it, so you can do that research on your own, but if you do know something about it, I'd like to know in the comments below. And these ingredients are kind of hard to find sometimes, so if you're looking for them and you can't find them in a local grocery store, I'm going to add a link below where I got them from Amazon. Anyway, we're going to mix all that together on medium high speed for several minutes until we can get stretchy dough that we can see light through. If you've done the window pane test, you know what I'm talking about. I let mine go for about six to eight minutes, and then I'm adding it to a large oil bowl to let it rise at room temperature for one to two hours. Once risen, we're gonna dump it onto a lightly floured work surface and divide it into six even pieces. Mine each weighed about 150 grams, and then we're just gonna shape each piece into a rough ball shape and kind of wrap it around itself to make it smooth. And then we're gonna rest that under a towel for another 15 to 30 minutes, which will then take out each ball and then shape it into a rough rectangle shape. And then we're gonna fold the two ends towards the middle as you can see me doing, pressing a seam each time. We're gonna kind of pinch that seam together so it can form a fully smooth log, and then we can stretch it lengthwise a bit and kind of roll the ends to taper it just to make it look more like a baguette. I rested these on some parchment lined baking sheets under towels again for 30 minutes to an hour while I preheated my oven. And for the oven, I'm actually gonna use my pizza stone to increase the heat transfer into the bread as it bakes. But if you don't have one of these, I've seen people say that you can use a baking sheet flipped upside down as long as it's well preheated. I'm putting the pizza stone on the middle rack and then I'm adding an empty baking dish to the bottom rack, which I'm going to add water to later to create steam. But I'm going to preheat both of these at 475F or 245C for the 45 minutes that I'm doing my last proof with the bread. But finally, when I'm ready to bake, I'm going to take a sharp razor knife and score the bread in three separate spots like this. And then I'm going to form the buns into kind of a triangle shape that's going to go around the edges of my pizza stone because I don't want one just in the middle because that's going to get most of the heat. I want each of these to get an even amount of heat. I'm going to spray them all with water just before going in again to create steam. And then I'm going to carefully add them onto the pizza stone trying to even them out. And then I'm going to pour a bit of water into the hot baking dish which is going to immediately steam up. And then finally I'm just going to spray all the surfaces of the oven with as much water as I can and I'll hurry up and close it to enclose as much steam as possible. The steam is going to help us get the crispy outer crust while keeping the interior nice and soft. Every five minutes or so, I'm going to rotate the buns around the pizza stone to promote even cooking, and then I'm just going to spray a bunch more water, and then I'll close back up. I pulled these when the crust was nice and browned. Mine might be a little too brown for your liking, but that's up to you. I liked how it came out. I repeated the process with the other three buns, and then I rested these on a wire rack until they came down to room temperature. Also, obligatory fresh bread ASMR. Oh yes. So you can store these at room temp in a plastic bag until you need them. I planned on doing these the day before I was going to eat the bun me, just as I did with the pork, but that night I got impatient and I decided to just make my sandwich. It had been several hours since I put the pork in the fridge, so it was ready to go. So to assemble the sandwich, I started by grabbing the pork roast out of the fridge, and I cut a couple of small strips off the side, and then I cut those strips into smaller bite-sized pieces, which we're going to crisp in a cast iron. I also grabbed one of the buns, and then I cut almost all the way through just so I could split it and kind of butterfly it open, but keep a hinge on the bottom. I threw the bun into a 350F or 180C oven to let it crisp up and kind of warm through for about five minutes. Meanwhile, to crisp the pork, I put a cast iron over medium high heat, and then I spooned a bit of the pork fat that cooled off while the pork belly was in the oven, but you can just use a bit of neutral oil here. I fried the pieces, flipping constantly until I got this crispy crust on both sides, which is texture that we're gonna need in the sandwich. We also need to get a couple of vegetables ready. I'm slicing this green jalapeno nice and thin. You can also do red jalapeno or Thai chili, and you can put as much as you want depending on your spice tolerance. I'm also getting a cucumber and slicing it thin. You can just do regular coins, 
but I just wanted to do this long thin strip because I thought it looked cool. Long boy. And finally, I'm just tearing a few stems of cilantro. I don't think it's necessary or even traditional to chop them for this sandwich. It's also a good idea to grab a couple handfuls of your pickled vegetables and drain them in a strainer or just get some paper towels and wipe them off. You don't want them to be too wet in your sandwich. For your sandwich sauce, you have a lot of options. I kept mine simple with just some QP mayo and sriracha to make a spicy mayo. Although in hindsight, I wish I would have put a little bit of fish sauce in there. Either way, it's time to assemble. I'm going to start by removing a little bit of the top half of the bread in the sandwich to give us more room to close it. And that's a good little snack for the chef. I don't think we did too bad for our first time making this French style baguette, but I'm spreading a generous amount of the spicy mayo on both sides. And then I think this step is vital. I took some Maggi seasoning, which again, you can find at your Asian market. I would describe it as a more distinctly flavored soy sauce. It's traditional to sprinkle a little bit on both sides of the bread. This is going to amp up the flavor a whole lot. I'm going to lay the cucumber down on the bottom side, followed by our juicy and crispy pork, and then as many of your pickled vegetables as you want. And then we'll finish up with our fresh cilantro and fresh jalapeno slices. It's also traditional to add some liver pate to the sandwich. I just couldn't find any, but I still think we came out with a beautiful homemade bun mi. Just a perfect blend of fermented and fresh and cooked just all the textures and all the flavors that you want in a sandwich. I think it's time to taste. So many wonderful flavors packed into one small sandwich. I mean, even the French roll, it's not perfect, but I think it still came out great. It started to cool off a bit because of all the pictures and things I had to do, but oh well. Let's get into this thing. Just super flavorful. Each component is very well seasoned and flavored. They come together beautifully in a sandwich like this. I think this is a wonderful combination. I probably could have done better in terms of authenticity and I'd be willing to try this again, but I still think this came out great for a first try. There's nothing like the rich fattiness of the pork and the mayo and then pairing that with the vinegar and the bite of the jalapenos. And the cilantro on top is just the perfect icing on the cake for this whole thing. Whoever came up with this idea was a genius and I'm so happy that this exists. This is another one of those recipes that's a lot of work, um, but you don't have to make the bread on your own. You can get really good quality bread at most grocery stores. The pork belly is not really a lot of work. It's just a set and forget kind of thing. But I'm doing this because I have off for a couple of nights for Mardi Gras, so I decided to put some effort into doing this and I'm glad that I did it. If you've never tried to make a bun mi, I hope that this video has given you some motivation to go out there and try it. But thank you for watching and I'll see y'all next time.